In the days when royalty wore crowns without concern, Haferkamp served as honor guard during state visits. Such were the occasions when the King of Austria, the King of Italy, General Bismarck, and General Moltke visited the Kaiser of Germany. But the real thrill came when Haferkamp was chosen for the guard assigned to the Shah of Persia. He says, quote, he even had diamonds on his shoulder boards. You should have seen them. They really gleamed. When Mr. Haferkamp thinks of army life, he smiles and says, those were the best days of my life. Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, my name's Ashton, and along with my husband Jonathan and our son Jack, we're the Black Forest family. A few months back, we shared our ancestry journey and took you along with us as we discovered the immigration story of our families and reconnected with lost relatives in Ostfriesland. And although maybe it kind of sounds a little silly, it was really one of those experiences where it just sort of makes your heart and your soul feel more connected to have real memories and places to put with your family's origin story. And although we may now be a hundred years removed from it, we're here because of the choices they made. Now, in that particular video, we were actually exploring the Shuttler and the Oltman side of our family trees. But in that video, I also mentioned that there was another branch of my family tree that also interestingly connected me right back here to Germany. Like many immigrants at the turn of the 20th century, people from a particular culture often congregated together in this new land that they were cultivating into their new home. And this was the case for my family. Uh, much of my dad's side actually moved to a small farming community and actually helped to found this farming community called Hartsburg, Illinois. I mean, the name should kind of be a giveaway, but it was built by German immigrants in the 1800s. And today, my dad still farms in central Illinois, in large part because of this legacy. But there's one such founding member of that community whose life story is so much more than that of just a small rural farmer. In fact, before driving tractors across the American prairie, he was once a personal bodyguard to Kaiser Wilhelm II escorting foreign dignitaries such as the King of Italy, General Bismarck, and General Moltke to the Kaiser's personal chambers, and even living on the palace grounds in Potsdam. And I'm so excited to finally share his extraordinary story with you. So, let's get started. When I started researching about my great-great-grandfather, Henry, um, I honestly really didn't have a whole lot to work with. Most of it was just family stories that had been passed down about his life. Ever since I was little, I can always remember his portrait hanging in my grandparents' home. You see, my grandpa was a military guy who was also fiercely proud of our family heritage. He served as a commanding officer in the Second World War for the US Air Force. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was stationed in Warrington, England and fell in love with a Kansas nurse who was taking care of one of his men, quite frankly, I wouldn't be here today. And you know, maybe some of that is like a weird genetic predisposition. Like I said, I always fondly remember this gigantic portrait of my great great grandfather hanging on my grandparents' wall in their home with this like really beautiful gilded frame. I remember being really little and my grandpa pointing at it and saying, that's great, great grandfather Henry. He was a bodyguard to a Kaiser. But I should mention like a lot of family folklore, sometimes details get fuzzy or maybe even a little embellished. Like for example, my grandpa always claimed that the Kaiser liked Prussian men uh, because they were tall and stocky and intimidating. And quite frankly, I really didn't know how much of that was truth or fiction. Although interestingly enough, I actually did find a passport for my great great grandfather from the 1920s. And it turns out the guy was like six foot four and a half, which is like just around two meters. 
It's, it, I mean, it, maybe there is some, some truth there. But the rest of the family stories about Henry are honestly vague. My grandpa told me that he came from a long line of farmers, but he really didn't have many opportunities in the small village where he was raised. Which village? He had no idea. You know, he did say though that my grandpa Henry taught him how to count and how to swear in German, which by the way, my grandfather so lovingly bestowed onto me. <laughs> it was so it was a funny little turn of events. The first words I ever actually learned how to say in German were um, colorful, <laughs> to say the least. But here's the frustrating part. Beyond this picture of him, when I would go online and try to do research, all of the records for him began in the United States. I couldn't find any information about his life before his immigration sometime around 1893 or 1894, when he just shows up in New York City at the age of 27 or 28. My family members have always said that he left from Bremen, but after scouring online databases and looking at many, many ship manifests from the Bremen archives and the Norddeutsche Lloyd, I couldn't find a single manifest with his name on it. I mean, I even contacted the German Federal Military Archives for records for his service. Nothing. I even searched German birth record databases and kept finding absolutely nothing. But you know, there was always kind of one detail about great great grandpa Henry that always kind of bothered me, especially now that I live here in Germany, because Henry is a very English name. And it's one that certainly would not have been very common, particularly for like the 1860s when he was born in Germany or then parts of Prussia. I mean, but my family always vehemently said that his name was Henry. I mean, his American records all say Henry. His passport said Henry. His tombstone says Henry Haferkamp. Quick disclaimer, I completely fully recognize that in German, his name would have been pronounced Hafekamp. However, I'm trying to sort of reconcile the way that it was originally pronounced with the way that my own family in the United States pronounces their last name, which in American English is Haferkamp. Grazie. So, I mean, it sounded kind of like a stretch, but this was really the only first clue that I had to kind of work with. And interestingly, I actually was kind of onto something. After we posted our first video on Jonathan and I's German ancestry this past fall, I was contacted by my father's cousin who gave me my first big break in finding out more about Henry's life. The copy of Henry's marriage certificate. According to his marriage documents, he was living in and around Mousy, New York, which is a small community outside of New York City near the New Jersey border. He was 28 years old and working as a farmer. Like many men at that time, his ticket to the US probably consumed most of the money he had to his name. And also more than likely the currency that he did have on him probably wasn't worth anything when he arrived. So many immigrants would live and work around their port of arrival and try to save up enough money until they could continue their journey inland. And here on this document was the best clue I had thus far about his previous life, his place of birth and it's listed as Bad Bergen, Hanover, Germany. And his father, a man also named Henry Heferkamp, and his mother, Margaretha Maybach. So this was a big deal. This was the first time I had ever seen his place of birth, or I had ever seen the names of his parents on any official record including his birthday. But I dug and dug and I still could not find a single record of a man named Henry born in Bad Bergen any time that year. So I started working off of that hunch that I mentioned earlier. What if his name was not Henry? What if this was an assumed alias he took upon himself when he moved to the United States? So I figured I had nothing to lose. Why don't I start looking through all of the German databases for Heinrich Hefakamp, even though he never went by this name. And it turns out 
my hunch was pretty much on the right track. Although I couldn't photocopy the document, I was able to source the Evangelische Church book from Königreich Hanover in 1866. And there he was, Heinrich Wesselschwiedhard Hefakam, baptized on the 5th of May, 1866 in Bad Bergen. A boy born on the 20th of April, 1866, to Johann Gerhard Heinrich Hefakamp and Anna Katharina Margaritha Hefakamp. So this was pretty wild because not only did Henry change his name on his American documents, he also changed his parents' names to more anglicized names, which is wildly fascinating because neither of his parents emigrated to the United States. They, they stayed in Germany, in Bad Bergen. But the treasure trove from my dad's cousin didn't just stop with this marriage certificate. He sent over some of the best photographs. I love that even in these pictures, you can just tell that he looks like such a tall guy. And there's something about the way he's standing, the way he's holding his body, its posture. It looks so much like my grandpa, Roger. But this one was actually taken when he was 90 years old, and I think it's my favorite photograph of him. He just looks so kind, and I would have loved to have met him. You know, while finding his marriage certificate was really, really cool, I still was just a little bit disappointed because I really wanted to learn more about his time in the military and his military service. And unfortunately, because I submitted my initial request as Henry Heifekamp, um, of course, the Bundes military archive in Freiburg came back and said that they didn't have any records of this man because it was the wrong name. Um, and unfortunately, requests like this take a lot of time, not just to submit all the formal paperwork, but then time to process it. So unfortunately, at the time of filming this video, I haven't heard back from my second request yet to see if there's any archives of his military service that are still around. But you know, honestly, <laughs> after that discovery, I kind of thought this is where the trail went cold for my great, great grandpa, Henry. But then my dad's cousin sent me not one, but two of the most extraordinary documents. Apparently in February of 1931, Henry gave his local Hartsburg newspaper an interview, an interview where he recounted his service to Kaiser Wilhelm II, as well as a second interview he gave when he turned 90 years old, looking back on his life and what brought him to the United States. So I'm gonna do something that's quite a little bit unusual for our channel. I'd like to read some of the excerpts from both articles and include clips that we took in Potsdam, historical photographs that I was able to source from the German archives, and family photographs to tell the story, Henry's story. Now, both of these articles are quite long, so I'm only going to really just be reading aloud the excerpts that I thought were particularly cool and intriguing, but if you'd like to read them in full, uh, I'm also going to make a post on the community tab on YouTube where you can go and read the whole thing if you would like to. So for now, you can sit back, relax, and enjoy what I truly believe is such an extraordinary life and somebody who I'm just so honored to call my family member. Mr. Haferkamp has had many interesting experiences while he served as personal bodyguard for the Kaiser of Germany. Mr. Haferkamp, at the age of 22 in the year 1888, began his army life and continued until 1891. In those days, Germany was prosperous and the soldiers loved the Kaiser and called him a good man. The young men of Germany awaited with eagerness their time to serve in the army, and it was a special honor to be one of the soldiers in the Kaiser's personal bodyguard. Only the tallest men were chosen because the Kaiser wanted his bodyguard to look very impressive to any visiting monarchs. Mr. Haferkamp's impressive height of six foot four and a half inches quickly brought him to the attention of officers assigned to the guard at Potsdam during the next three years, Haferkamp served as guard, ammunition trucker, and swimming instructor. He remembers many guard tours at the Potsdam Palace, recalling it as, quote, a wonderful castle filled with old marble. 
In the days when royalty wore crowns without concern, Haferkamp served as honor guard during state visits, made by many rulers. When any high officer announced that he would visit the Kaiser, as an act of courtesy and protection, the Kaiser sent his personal bodyguards to meet him. Such were the occasions when the King of Austria, the King of Italy, General Bismarck, and General Moltke visited the Kaiser of Germany. Mr. Haferkamp recalls one special visit by the Russian Tsar and two ceremonies from the Kaiser of the neighboring Austro-Hungarian Empire. But the real thrill came when Haferkamp was chosen for the guard assigned to the Shah of Persia. Haferkamp remains impressed to this day by the lavish costume worn by the Persian ruler. He says, quote, he even had diamonds on his shoulder boards. You should have seen them. They really gleamed. When General Moltke was 90 years old, he was living in Berlin. He was honored by a parade of soldiers bearing torches. The soldiers marched past his home for two hours. Bismarck was recognized by the soldiers as the real leader of Germany, and the people had great respect for him. The Kaiser lived at Potsdam because it was well fortified. There were many castles and beautiful gardens there. Each year in the fall, all divisions of the German army, including infantrymen and cavalrymen, went to Berlin to display their splendid clothes and their excellent military training. The military display was held from morning until late afternoon and the Kaiser and the high officers were mounted in front. One company of the army marched directly behind them carrying flags. The armed bodyguard followed, and behind them, the other divisions of the army. The soldiers wore very tall, top-heavy hats. They were fastened beneath the chin by leather straps. A magnificent parade was given in Berlin, but just at the moment when Mr. Haferkamp was opposite the Kaiser, the strap beneath his tall hat became unfastened. He dared not touch it. If it fell from his head, it would be trampled upon by the feet of many soldiers. And besides that, there was a week in prison with just bread and water. Fortunately for Mr. Haferkamp, the hat maintained its balance. At this point in the story, Mr. Haferkamp was interrupted by his wife, who exclaimed, but you couldn't help it. Yes, he nodded, but there was no excuse. I should have looked after that. Then he chuckled, but I tell you, it never happened again. Mr. Haferkamp, at his home, he still has the suit he was wearing when that incident occurred. It's more than 40 years old today, but it still looks brand new. It's made of heavy blue serge, trimmed around the neck with red. It's made in a severely military style, with silver buttons, braid, and a padded front. On the inside of the back of the neck, a small piece of material was fastened, upon which was written, Grafeiter Haferkamp, Leib, Compagni refers to the division of the army which he belonged, the first company of the regiment. This was the highest division of the army. But the private life and instruction of the soldiers was just as interesting as their public appearance. Occasionally, they were allowed to go within the town. In winter, they attended the dances in the town. On summer evenings, they strolled about the Potsdam Gardens. When the days were bad, the soldiers sang. If interest was lagging, the officers purchased several dozen eggs, boiled them, and wrote upon them some article which could be purchased at the German restaurants. These eggs were thrown into 10 feet of water and the soldiers dived for them. What had been written upon the egg, which a soldier brought up from the water, he was given free of charge in a restaurant nearby. Cigars and something to eat or drink were often secured in this way. At Christmas time, the soldiers rivaled each other to secure the best tree for their room. Money was collected from the soldiers' pay for the Christmas festivities. On Christmas night, everyone spread out his gifts in the basement and decorated them with evergreen. The officers looked over at the gifts and sat about talking with the soldiers. The evening meal consisted principally of beer and fried meat. Huge sacks of nuts were opened and each soldier received as many as he could carry in his hands. If the soldiers desired more spending money, they secured a small boat into which they could float down a stream of water to pick water lilies. Forget-me-nots were also often plucked to use in bouquets, and they sold these bouquets for 10, 20, and 50 marks. But the soldiers also remembered to send one of their bouquets to the Kaiser's wife. They were sometimes two or three feet tall and would remain fresh for several weeks. After service as guard, Haferkamp attended the Wild West show of Buffalo Bill in Berlin. 
perhaps this show impressed him to seek his fortune in the new world. At any rate, when he returned to his home in Bad Bergen, Haferkamp signed over his inheritance rights and left to join his uncle on a New Jersey farm. When Mr. Haferkamp thinks of army life, he smiles and says, those were the best days of my life. You know, I don't really know why this story makes me so emotional, but it's just so, so cool and such a treasure to hear this story in his words, in his voice. I mean, he, recounting his own life. I should also mention, I actually did email and ask the conservators while in Potsdam if they had any information about the barracks where the guards would have lived on the palace grounds, and they said they really didn't know. Uh, more likely than not, if the building still stands, which is a giant if, um, it would likely be part of Humboldt University today. But you know, even if I'm not able to actually go visit the room where he would have slept while he worked as a palace guard, it was such a treasure to be able to walk the beautiful, beautiful Potsdam Gardens. And I feel so lucky that my family has these memories that they can pass on to future generations. And I feel really honored to be able to tell his story and share it with you guys. But you know, as always, if you have any special stories that you would like to share with me about your family history, if maybe you have some other resources that I might be able to use to kind of continue my ancestry journey and learn more about my family history, that you can share, please let me know. Please let me know down in the comment section of this video. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So I will see you next Sunday. Cheers.